Uh, my name is Jane Wright and I am the Treasurer of the Australian Science Teachers Association and it is my great pleasure to be able to introduce to you uh, Tim and Stephanie today. Um, uh, Tim and Stephanie joined us for dinner on uh, Saturday night and I found them to be a most energetic, lively and entertaining couple. So I'm quite certain that they are going to have a fantastic presentation today. Just a little bit of background. Tim and Stephanie work at the CAPER Centre for Astronomy and Physics Education Research. I just thought that was a great name. I don't know if there's some history in that, but CAPER sounded like a great name for a research institute. Um, they work in discipline-based education, and uh, it's the intersection between cognitive science and astronomy education. And I think that's fascinating to have people who are working at that intersection between science and education. Stephanie earned her PhD at the University of Arizona in teaching, learning and sociocultural studies, where she studied the educational impact of scientific research experiences on women in astronomy. Tim is at the University of Wyoming Excellence in, Excellence in Higher Education Endowed Chair of Science Education. That's a very long term. <laughs> and he also holds appointments as professor in both the UW College of Science and the UW College of Education. Now these two are highly recognised speakers um, and to the extent where they're funded by both the USA National Science Foundation and NASA. And they focus on developing classroom ready teaching strategies to intellectually engage students at all levels in authentic science inquiry. So please join with me in welcoming Tim and Stephanie. No. Before you get going. So we're fighting a so we're fighting a multiple microphone situation here. So Stephanie, once you start here, and we'll see what happens. All right. <laughs> but he may not get another word in, so I thought I'd let him go. That was it. Um, that was it. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Pleasure to see you. <laughs> so um, you can see from our title that we wanted to talk about misconceptions, and it's a little bit of a. Um, a not controversial title, but something maybe poke at some people because um, in science education for the last 30 or 40 years, we've been rather in love with the idea of misconceptions and talking about students' misconceptions and cataloging them and discussing them over lunch. And, um, and once we see a student have a problem, we say, ah, oh, that's a misconception, and we're, we're really in love with them. But it turns out that over the past 40 years, they failed to fulfill their promise of being able to really change science education. And sometimes for us as teachers, and I taught um, secondary science for 15 years, sometimes as, as teachers, the list of misconceptions does nothing but frustrate us. So um, we thought, hmm, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is something to misconceptions, but we have to start thinking about them in a new way. So um, in case we don't get to the end, in case we don't get to the punchline, there's a fairly good odd of that. We thought we'd just tell you what the whole talk is going to be. And that way, if you have to leave because you have a session or for some other reason, you just get bored with us, you'll know what we're going to say. And that is that misconceptions are not particularly fruitful for us. Instead, we need to reconceive of this huge umbrella of misconceptions as being different categories of much more specific problems. And once we figure out what category of misconception goes into, then we can do something about it instead of just talk about it. Anyway, we think, our, our assertion that we're putting out there, is that misconceptions actually can be broken down into three discrete, discrete categories, and there's even sub-levels of those. But the first one is, is that sometimes students just have bad data. They have facts inside of their heads, and those facts are wrong. Easy enough. However, sometimes students have what we like to call bad software. They have algorithmic thinking, and those algorithms are usually very, very good things. They allow our students to survive in the world long enough to take science classes. Um, but sometimes in science, those algorithms run afoul of scientific realities. If we can pinpoint those things, we can do something about it. And the third category is that of cognitive structures or hardware, firmware, inside of the brain. And these cognitive structures kind of fall into two different categories. The first one we like to think of as being maybe more analytical in nature, spatial reasoning, analogical thinking, cognitive load, working memory, those kinds of things that sound very sciencey. And in the other category, we have 
affective issues, issues of identity, issues of emotions that get in the way of students being able to learn things. And they're not all the same. And not only are they not all the same, but they shouldn't be treated the same. And if we can figure out which one it is, we can figure out what to do better about it. So that's how we're going to end. And if you have to leave, we'll catch up with you later. So let's start. All right, if we look at the first category of misconceptions as bad data, what we actually think of is two levels. And in both cases, these are things that you have in your head that are wrong. Um, but on the first level, it's pretty easy to deal with it. Somebody has some bad data inside of their head, and all you need to do is tell them that. For instance, there's this, we haven't, we haven't done the clicker thingy yet, so we're, this is our first one. We'll see how we do. For instance, here's a question for you. Touch it delicately. Be nice. Be nice to it. Okay. okay. Got my clicker. Ready? <laughs> well, that's your clicker. Oh, no. I didn't want to click anyway. <laughs> so, all that got, <laughs> formatting got funny on the new, new slide. Um, <laughs> it's all out of order. I'll read it to you in the order in which it was meant to appear. Um, the, the question is, most Americans think that the capital of Australia is what? What do you think most Americans think is the capital of Australia? Is it Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, or Canberra? <laughs> See, the earth was, you, you don't have to, no, no. No discussing what you think the capital of the U.S. is. That's the next question. Um, the earth is supposed to be over there, the other stuff's supposed to be at the bottom. All right, so, um, <coughs> How exciting, 155 of you have responded. Is that everyone? Anybody still trying to figure it out? You can guess, all right. Let's see what they said. Pulling for <laughs> Hey, here we ah. go. So on the, it says 1% uh, said Canberra, 0% say Perth, 4% say Melbourne, and 95% say Sydney. 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 Oh. Sydney. And that's correct. We've done it. We haven't done an official poll of uh, citizens of the United States, but we're pretty sure that that's the right answer. By the way, does anybody know um, what? Where do most people on the planet think the capital of the U.S. is? New York. I know that's people in New York think so that too. So it's not true. Okay. Um, so that's bad data. <laughs> All right, it's just something that you're taking, a, you're taking a guess on. You've heard of Sydney before. You think that's good. I know a city in Australia. I should get points. And all it takes is for someone to say, no, that's wrong. It's Canberra. It's not Sydney. And it's, all it takes for me to do is to say, no, it's not New York City. New York City is not even the capital of New York. It's Washington, D.C., of course. So um, that's it. Bad data, easy fix. You, teacher talk can do that, right? And we kind of wish everything was that way, but it's not. I went the wrong way. The other kind of bad data is not so easy to fix. And in fact, um, students' real life experiences will sometimes confound their ability to understand something scientific, like in this case. Many students, and I've, I've taught in rural areas for, for a large part of my career, many of those students hunt, and it is very <laughs> difficult. You can tell them that a bullet shot horizontally and a bullet dropped hit the ground at the same time, and they say you're wrong. They will look right at the teacher's face and say, no, that's not right. Um, or they say nothing at all, and they pat you on your head, and they give you the answer, you give the, they give the answer you want, and then they go about their merry way. They do not believe that something shot out of a gun lands at the same time as something dropped. Right? The, the perception is getting in the way here. So we can do something about that using the model that many of us have been taught, the conceptual change model. How many, just a show of hands, how many conceptual change model, right? In that, you give your students uh, experience that provides them with a lovely sensation of cognitive dissonance, which means that the experience is in conflict with what they previous believed, pre previously believed, sufficiently so that it makes them uncomfortable. That's the dissonance part. You then help them work through finding a new explanation that is intelligible to them, it's plausible to them, and it's fruitful to them. <laughs> Like, for instance, um, how any physics teachers or physical science teachers, right? We frequently do something like this. 
We've got the little launcher. It shoots up forward. It drops about the same time. They hear the simultaneous clunk on the ground. Um, we show them lovely videos like this one. And so it's a cognitive dissonance experience. There's something intelligible and plausible. And then we find it's fruitful. We get to show up at the White House and do bazooka guns, potato guns, with the President of the United States. This works with students. Done this lots of times myself, taking all those boys that go out hunting on the weekend, and uh, they come in, they do this experiment, and they go, oh, wow, that works. I didn't know that. That's very cool. I can use that in life. It's a new way of viewing the world for me. <sighs> if it were only that easy. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> there are a set of, of teaching experiences, learning experiences, that will not respond to conceptual change. Even if the students tell you what you want to hear on the test, they don't believe you. And you've probably seen those kinds of experiences in seasons, some basic biology, which I've put in that basic term so that not give away the next thing. Density, which may be the mother of all difficult things to teach to students. Phases of the moon, the worst thing to try and teach in our science. Evolution, at least in the United States, very difficult. And climate change, also in the United States, very difficult to teach to students. All right, so our question, why do we have to reframe misconceptions is because we've got to get to those things. Some of those things are kind of important, like climate change, you know, so we need to be able to get inside of students' heads and make some, some headway there. So what do we do? Well. First, we're going to give you another clicker question. And we're going to see if this one works better than the last one did. Without talking to each other. Without talking to each other. It is very important you do not talk to each other about this. All right? So this is a picture. Anybody, anybody? Do you know where this is? This is my next trip to Australia. Yes. The Valley of the Giants over south of Perth. You have am amazing trees that if they were in the United States, everyone would be flocking there to see them, just like we go to... <laughs> just like we go, um, just like we flock to go see our sequoias. I had to double check because um, I could have messed it up. But the question is, you know, each one of those trees starts as a little seed. I mean, you could, you wouldn't even feel it in your hand. And it turns into this thing that is one of the largest organisms on the planet. It's huge beyond our conception sometimes, really. Where does it come from? Where does the mass of the tree come from? Okay, it starts with a little seed, and then it turns into a big thing. You're talking again. The two of them, Bernie. All right, so without talking to your neighbor, <laughs> what's the answer? Where does the mass of the tree come from? And considering that there's so many of you in this room that teach the life sciences, this ought to be good. Go. Yeah, you're talking. Votes here. You're talking. Oh. If you think it's soil, you may choose either one or four, and we'll, we'll add them up. If you'd like E, you can raise your hand afterwards. Yeah, or number five, you can raise your hand afterwards. All right, we've got, you could probably give it the count down there, Tim, because we're at 152. Did the video record the answers? No, let's see their answers. Okay. And the answer's revealed. Hmm. So 70% of you said the air, 25% of you said the water, 6% of you, I, I think. Fine. I can't say, it looks like the one I can see, some of, somebody didn't answer. One percent, so six altogether said soil. And you guys, the majority of you, have some kind of training in life sciences. Some of you have been teaching it for a very, very long time. And all the rest of you, I believe, have college degrees. So you have no excuse for not, and how many of you did ne have never taken a biology course, ever? Since birth, you've never been in a life science course. <laughs> Lies! And deceptions. The answer, of course, and because you're a fairly specialized audience, you did very well on this. The answer, of course, is the air. Carbon dioxide in the air. Oh. Uh, 
as, as opposed to the carbon dioxide in the water or in the soil or in the seed. No, but I think the air is going to win here. Um, so it turns out that in, non, in normal populations, unlike this one, where people have just had a biology class once or twice in their lives, almost no one gets this question right. So we want to show you a, we want to show you a video, which is, you ready? Hold on a second, Tim. This video that is going to pop up full screen in just a second is from the graduation ceremonies. It's a clip, interviews taken of 23 students at the graduation ceremonies at MIT and Harvard in the United States. And I'm guilty of graduating or attending one of those universities myself. And it's hard for me to watch this. But these are the best and brightest in the United States. Consider, for example, that the causes of the seasons is a topic taught in every standard curriculum. Tim, that's the wrong one. Uh, as the earth Despite the fact that I gave that instruction explicitly. Hit that button. <laughs> <laughs> Harvard girl, I want to say. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> Most of those were Harvard people. So, I can't blame them. <laughs> so um, the other choice that's supposed to be on there, which is on that slide, is the seed. And you, you get, you know, 20% of the students pick that. That's not a very good answer anyway. The soil is the one that they say. Now, I've personally sat in a classroom with a graduate student getting a PhD in science education who was so distraught by this answer that he argued and, and it had to come from the soil and finally, um, were you there Sawyer? So I want to say my, my 15 year old daughter was sitting there and she goes, well then where's the hole in the ground that all the mass came out of? And he just sat there going, uh, it is just so difficult to wrap your head around the fact that you can get a massive tree from the air that most people who don't have your training, they just simply can't do it. And in an era of climate change and dealing with our carbon budgets, that's not funny. Um, we watch the video. What's going on here? Why is it? Now, it, it, also in that video, I should say, it goes on, it's an hour long video. It shows students going through very, very good instruction related to photosynthesis. And still, at the end, being able to describe everything having to do with photosynthesis, at the end they still say that water makes up the most of the mass of the tree, that that's where it came from. There's just nothing that the middle school teacher could do to get them to change their mind. So why? Why are they so hung up on that? Well, inside of our brains we have little algorithms, and not everybody agrees on this, but a lot of us think that you're kind of born with these little algorithms. They're good things. Now, the misconception model would tell you that students have this conceptual framework inside of their heads. They have a solid idea. But the, the um, primitives model, the phenomenological primitives or the algorithm model, states that our brains are more like that whack-a-mole game that you have at the, um, you know, at the pizza place or at the fair or something like that. 
that you have these little things inside of your brain and they pop up and you have to try to whack them down all the time and half the time you miss them. They pop up unexpectedly and in, um, in, in terms of time and also in terms of where they pop up. Um, we think that these things are good things and that when students say things in our class like, well, you know, the tree must have come from water, that that doesn't make them dumb. In fact, the thing that's going on in their brain means that they're pretty smart. They've got something in there that's useful for survival purposes. And some people think that they have perhaps evolutionary um, functions, these little ideas. Um, another example of this potentially evolutionary profitable algorithm that you might have inside of your head is the idea that closer means more. Okay, can, can you give me an example of, in real life, anybody, where understanding that closer in general means more is a really good thing to know, like it might avoid death for you. Yeah. When a car is coming, to, what, what about it, what about the car are you getting more of as it comes closer? It's getting bigger? Yes. What else is getting more? What is more of as the car comes closer to you? The sound? Can you think of a place, yeah, it's the sound, the light, the noise, the heat, more means closer. And when that, that source is closer to you, that could be dangerous. You know, the, the sound of the wildebeest charging at you, as it gets louder, it's closer, you better run. As you get too close to the fire, you're in danger of getting burned. These kind of algorithms help little ones grow into big ones. For the most part, they work great. But sometimes they don't work so well. In the case of the seasons, which some of you were nodding your head at before. And Tim's going to show another video, and I have to say I can, I can claim more of these people as my own. And can you make it a little bigger? I took the easy job. Oh, here. Yes. <laughs> you went one feet. Oh, no. Don't make it. Cold the weather, and that's it. And hence the seasons. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the, the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. Well, the Earth goes around the sun. <laughs> and <laughs> And it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun, and it gets colder when we get further away from the sun. These graduates, like many of us, think of the Earth's orbit as a highly exaggerated ellipse. Even though the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular, with distance producing virtually no effect on the seasons, we carry with us the strong, incorrect belief that changing distance is responsible for the seasons. And I admit for you I guys think, this uh, model works. Physics, planetary motion, and relativity, and electromagnetism. I don't really have a scientific background whatsoever, and I and I got through school without having it. I've gotten very far without having it. I had uh, for quite a bit of science in high school, yeah. Uh, uh, physics, one first year, and two years of chemistry. Regardless of their science education, 21 of the 23 randomly selected students, faculty, and alumni of Harvard University revealed misconceptions when asked to explain either the seasons or the faces of the moon. When it's further away from the sun, then it gets colder. The Earth's position interferes with the reflection of the sun against the moon. So, as we pause a moment here, let us contemplate the sleeves on this man. Does anybody, I don't know if your system's the same here, do you have three chevrons on the sleeve, do you know what this means? He is a full professor at Harvard. Of what? Who? I don't know. It should be easy to know the answer to this question. That's all I'm saying. Um, but did you notice the authority with which they all incorrectly answered this question? They stated it beautifully. They're clearly A students. Um, they really, on the spot, came up with an answer that fit in with the algorithm that they had inside of their brains. And the video goes on to show that you get the exact same responses from the middle class, lower class kids who are taking uh, seventh grade earth science down the street in Cambridge. There's something inside of the human brain that despite of 
your upbringing, your socioeconomic status, your educational opportunities, or how good you are at school. Those things are completely irrelevant when it comes to some topics because there's something that's hardwired into the human brain. And I hate teaching these things because they're very tough. Um, they've got a couple different names, facets of knowledge, phenomenological primitives, which I love to say and then I love to abbreviate as P-prim as well because it's a big mouthful. They come up a lot and you might see some particularly um, difficult to teach topics on here. Anything in which um, closer is more gets in the way is pretty tough. That, we think that is the strongest of the P-prims. Um, teaching physics, students refuse to believe, they, they will give you the right answer on a test, but they refuse to believe that anything can remain in motion without additional force being applied to it, which makes it really tough to do physics problems in a way that's understandable. Um, interference, now, I don't know what that professor was saying. <laughs> I'm not sure he knew what it was saying. But he said something about the earth getting in the way of the sun and the reflection. Um, this is one of the problems that we see with students' understanding of the phases of the moon, is this conception that something has to be blocking your point of view in order for a, a shadow to be created. Um, that, even though it flies in the face of many common experiences, is a really strong idea in some students' minds. Uh, can't make something from nothing is huge. And that's what happens um, with the problem with photosynthesis. Every student can recite the equation for photosynthesis. They know, they, they can even tell you, you know, if you put a plant in a plastic bag, you don't let it have any air, the plant's going to die. They can tell you all of these things. But they never quite put it all together because their brain won't let them. That you can't get something from nothing, P prim, is really, really strong. It also gets in the way of students understanding the Big Bang. When we did some research on college students who had taken some of the best, who had had some of the best astronomy instruction available in the United States, it is almost impossible with just lecture to get students to understand the idea that the Big Bang meant everything came from nothing. Not even empty space, but nothing. Their brains won't take it. Um, E equals mc squared, and sort of in the opposite kind of direction, radioactive decay, very tough. Where did all that stuff go? Where did it come from? And the one, two, three, more is kind of primitive math. I can count one, I can count two, I can count three. At some point, it's just a lot. You know, one wildebeest, I might be okay. Two wildebeest, I should probably start moving. Three wildebeest coming at me, I'm going to run. More than three, it doesn't matter. I better take off. Um, and when we deal with students in terms of time and scale, in terms of large numbers, they don't know the difference between a million and a billion. And if you're honest, most of us don't either. We just know the words are different. <laughs> but what does that largeness mean after some point? It's all the same. So P perms are really tough. And I wish I could tell you that we knew what to do about it, but we don't. Um, these things are inside of our brains and they help us survive. So we really think that all we can do about it is to walk in humility and to tell students that their brains are doing it. When we teach photosynthesis, to say to them, look, the mass is coming from the air, the carbon dioxide in the air. Your brain doesn't like that. Your brain doesn't like a big tree coming from air because you think of air as nothing. And most of the time your brain is pretty good stuff. But in this particular case, your brain is telling you wrong, and you're going to have to fight it. That's, I wish I had better news, but that's all we got. All we can do is, is help our students be aware of what's going on inside their own minds. So that takes us to the next area, which is cognitive structures. And that can be a lot of stuff, and we can't talk about all that stuff right now. So we're going to choose one of them, which is because it's my favorite. We're going to talk about spatial reasoning. Now, some kids are very naturally, are naturally very good spatial reasoners. And you've seen these kids. They, they aren't identified in, in any kind of formal way in our school settings. But they are the kids who always go for the Legos, who can build the Lego robot without instructions, and who understand that the backside probably needs to look like the front side and know how to flip it inside of their minds in order to make that thing happen. They are also the kids who know how to take apart a carburetor or any small motor 
do something to it, maybe even make it better and put all the parts back together. They're also the kids who frequently flee our science classes. Not because they can't do it, but because they think the science classes aren't very fun. I've actually interviewed some of my own old students and I thought of myself as a pretty good teacher. What I learned is that they thought that my class was stupid and it might also be true that I was stupid. They weren't sure and they were too polite to say. But that's what's going on inside the brain of a great spatial reasoner. Now, what about the rest of us, those of us who aren't good spatial reasoners? Well, it turns out that it gets in the way of us being able to learn science more poor spatial reasoners. Now, this, the seasons we were talking about before. The seasons are a particularly difficult topic to teach because there's multiple things going on there. There is bad data. Students have really erroneous senses of astronomical geography. They don't know which is bigger, the sun, the moon, the earth, and you think, how can that be? But it's true. They don't know where things are in relationship in space, where the sun, the earth, and all the other stars are. The number of high school graduates that we can interview who think that the North Star is closer to us than our own sun is nearly all of them, even after having taken astronomy twice. Um, we, have <laughs> we have seen and reported on geocentric models of upper middle class kids who have taken astronomy. They will consistently draw pictures of the sun going around the earth. Mm -hmm. So there's bad effects going on there. And there's the P prim. They love the distance equals more thing. And they will take any image you give them and stretch that into the distance being the explanatory variable here. They'll see pictures like this and they'll say, aha, sometimes we lean in towards the sun and sometimes we lean away. They will, this picture should probably be ripped out of every textbook that teaches astronomy because kids with poor spatial reasoning look at this and see an oval. Those with good spatial reasoning look at it and see a foreshortened circle. Of course, the kids with good spatial reasoning didn't need our help anyway. They already understood the answer. So for kids who don't already get it, this, this picture just makes things worse. So what do we do? This, this, this topic of the seasons is actually the thing that drove me so insane I went to graduate school because I had to figure out what it is that I was doing wrong. I had tried everything. I tried more graphics. I had made my students chart hours of sunlight all over the planet at all different latitudes and longitudes and angles of incidence, and I had had them do starry night and all kinds of stellarium kinds of things and everything else and got absolutely nowhere, except that the A kids could already tell me the test answer and the other kids refused. and It didn't do anything really. I was a complete fail. And that is because the real thing that's going on with the seasons, the real key to understanding it is being a good spatial reasoner. It's a highly complex three-dimensional system. You've got multiple bodies in motion, plus you've got light, which is this amorphous kind of thing, and you've got angles of incidence, and you've got time going on. It requires kids to visualize a system that's so large that they can never actually see it with their own eyes, which is environmental reasoning. They've got to shift their own position within the system. They've got to move the system around. Forget about it. It is a very tough spatial problem to work. So what do you do about that? Well, we tried out this curriculum that uh, a friend of ours had made, uh, Sherry Morrow, who's standing here in the front, who's leaning here in the front. She'd come up with sky time kinesthetic astronomy. And it's a thing where you get kids to use their bodies to kinesthetically model what's going on with the seasons. You have them, it, the, the thing I love about this curriculum is it costs nothing. You have some object in the middle which you call the sun. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be a chair or a stool or anything sitting there in the middle. You have all the kids stand around the circle and each one becomes the earth. All right, some of you may have seen this, Mount Nose. Has anyone ever done that? It's okay. Um, anyway, each kid is in the Earth's orbit, and for kids who previously didn't understand that the Earth goes around the sun, they don't have that problem after this. But you have them spin, and they can actually see with their own eyes that as they turn their bodies, the sun appears and it disappears. So we're using their egocentric perceptions to help support them in the thing that their brain, their spatial reasoning piece, can't figure out for them. We have them tilt, and we put the, const the, the zodiacal constellations on the outside. As they go around the circle, they see different constellations. 
as they tilt in different ways, always tilting up towards Polaris, um, they can either see the sun a lot or not see it at all. Sometimes it appears overhead, sometimes it's way down on the, the horizon. And then we assess their learning with non-multiple choice, non-close-ended questions. They look something like this. You know, just why is it hotter in summer and cooler in winter? We accept all kinds of answers on this because we have a lot of students in our class, at least in the US, we have a lot of students who don't speak English, or second language learners, students who have uh, reading and writing difficulties, and they frequently can't write out their answers in words. So we allowed them to submit pictures. And what we found when we broke up the data into different categories was that after eight weeks, eight weeks after instruction, which in research, educational research is considered longitudinal, which is kind of sad, but it's true, um, we found that they had experienced a very, a large, a very large normalized gain in each of the areas. Hello. I just saw, I just saw Dan McKinnon there. I hadn't seen him before. Anyway, we saw that in the area where we just wanted them to learn where things were in the solar system, that they had a normalized gain of 34%, which is considered large in educational research in any domain. We found that when it came to understanding what kind of events occurred when an object rotates, they increased even more than that, which is strange, don't you think? Don't you think that just, you know, where is the sun, where is the moon should be easier to learn than what happens when the earth rotates? She, did she say no? What was really kind of freaked us out was when we looked at events that occur because of the earth's orbit and because of its tilt, they experienced a normalized gain of nearly 70%, which is absolutely unheard of in educational research. That means of all that the, the 100% that they could have improved, they improved 70%. And not only have we never seen anything related to seasons that got kids to understand it at this level, we'd never seen an intervention that hit at 70%. We then disaggregated the data, and we pulled out all the kids that were at risk. These are kids who um, are homeless, kids who don't speak English, kids who've been diagnosed with a medical or cognitive difficulty that impairs their learning, um, kids that had, uh, they were in what we call juvenile detention. I don't know if you know, kids in lockup. We pulled out the data for those kids, and what we saw was even more weird. Down here on the really tough stuff, their scores are statistically the same as all the other kids. So those kids who normally can't learn any science are doing just as well as the smart kids. But up here where the, you know, where is the sun, is the sun bigger than the moon, that kind of stuff, we got nothing. 11% gain, that, that's nothing. When we went back and did an analysis, what we found was up here, this is all teacher talking. This down here is where the teacher stopped talking and had the kids in motion acting it out. All we had to do to get kids to learn something that requires spatial cognitive structures is to stop talking to them and do something spatial with them so that they could learn it. Which is brilliant. It shows that we know what we're doing. We're fabulous. We've been able to do this with lots of different things. We go, oh, that's spatial. Oh, that's cognitive load. Oh, that's, you know, um, something we use conceptual change on. Everything was working for us. But then we found this series of didn't work. And these topics all involve students' epistemologies, which is the rules by which they think knowledge can be gained, or their ontolo ontological systems, which is the way they view the world. In other words, Anything that had to do with how they felt, the way they viewed the universe, um, the way they viewed their identity, none of this other stuff worked. They basically stick their fingers in their ears and they go, no, 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 I'm not listening to you. Well, that would be okay if it weren't for the fact that these are really important topics. I mean, for instance, in our situation, where um, Tim and I are, we're in Wyoming, we can't get students to listen to us about climate change. Does anybody happen to know why that might be a particular problem in the great state of Wyoming in the U.S.? <laughs> it, what'd you say? 
anybody have a guess what might be going on in the state of Wyoming? Denial. <laughs> it's the state of denial. <laughs> What'd you say? It's full of oil. And it's full of trees and gas and coal and uranium and antelope, but most of the other things. It turns out that the state of Wyoming provides 60% of the energy needs of the United States. More than the Saudis, the Canadians, the Venezuelans, anything, anybody else. Which means that if I've got a student sitting in my class and I'm trying to talk to him about coal, he doesn't just hear the word coal. What else does he hear? Job. And not just his job, which, by the way, with just a high school diploma, you can make $80,000 a year driving for BP in a little town called Rock, Rock Springs. Rock Springs. $80,000 a year without college education. His parents' jobs. Grandfather's job. So you think about all those nights around the dinner table talking about dad's work, talking about grandfather's work, and what's going on at the plant, and how's it going with the business, and how are we going to pay our bills. Coal is not just a word in the state of Wyoming. It is identity to people. In Denver, interestingly enough, we have a similar problem, even though everyone would say how green they are. They love to talk about using uh, recycled paper products. And they love to talk about driving their Prius. But they also love living in the suburbs and driving 45 miles to work every day. They also love being able to drive 100 miles at the drop of a hat to go camping over the weekend. So different things, but same thing. Their identity is bound up in their ability to consume stuff. So what do you do with this? You guys might not have, I don't think you guys have much excuse me, much problem here with the Big Bang and with macroevolution, do you? Just a little bit. We have a problem with a very, very extraordinarily vocal, very small portion of the population. Just, just big enough to cause trouble. Um, but we do, we have a rising problem in terms of vaccination protocols and losing our herd immunity because there's a significant number of people who've heard that vaccinations will cause autism. And they've heard that from celebrities, right? Of course, now, if you've got an autistic child, which is a rising portion of our population, you're not going to vaccinate any of the rest of your children because you feel it. It's part of you, and you would do anything to avoid this a second time around. So what do we do with this? We've turned to this idea of hot conceptual change, which sort of takes us back to where we began with conceptual change. Um, hot conceptual change is anywhere where people get hot. It's these very topics. And what we've found is that it is almost completely counterproductive to be direct in instruction on these topics with people who are hot about them. It's a pretty simple formula. People have emotions, and they have personal dispositions. And when you put those two things together, it has an impact on learning. There are emotions that occur when someone hears the word like coal in Wyoming is either anger or threat. If they're angry, that's actually good, because then they're engaged. If they've got threat, they shut down. Your only problem is you don't know what they're going to do ahead of time. Very dangerous to, to elicit this threat response in your students. In terms of dispositions, students either have a cognitive disposition, which means they feel angry, and they're going to go out and research it and prove you wrong. Or they have a closure habit, which just means they shut down. They sit in your class the rest of the term, and they write what they have to on the paper, and they kind of hate you the whole rest of the time. Um, we see astronomers do this a lot in their classes, um, particularly if it's a general ed class. They want to start out that first week going at um, astrology and a religion and all these other things. And the students who are in their classes who have those kind of belief systems, when we interview them later, they hate those professors. And they do what they do to get through that class, but they really don't learn anything else from them. They've shut them out. Anyway, what we see here is that you either activate somebody if they're in this column, or you deactivate these people and you never get them back. So what do you do? Well, we do what we always do. 
we remember that it's not what the teller does, but what the learner does, right? So we're going to engage the learner in the way that we have to to get them to learn, and we're going to cross our fingers and hope it goes okay. We're going to focus on the student. We are not going to threaten them. We're not going to deliberately make them angry. And I know sometimes it's fun to do that, but don't do that. We're going to mute the emotional environment. All right? We are not going to talk about, on, on these topics, we are not going to talk about our students' personal beliefs, which flies in the face of all the warm, fuzzy love that we've learned for the last 30 years, which says that you have to engage their personal beliefs. No, don't do it on these topics. Instead, we're going to focus on this created person out here, not, not a real person. We're going to create fake people for them to respond to. And we're going to engage them in refutational text. So refutational text is a fancy term that our friends down here have come up with. But basically what it means is we're going to set up a fake scenario and we're going to ask them to respond to it. We're going to ask them to analyze someone else's thoughts rather than analyzing their own. And here's kind of what they look like. This is one from astronomy related to cosmology. Okay, we set it up by saying, here's two students. This one says this. This one says this. What do you think about what they've said? No, no, it's really simple, actually. We haven't asked the student what they think. We've said, here's two other people who are not you, so feel free to criticize. What do you think about what they think? Respond to them. Who's right? Who's wrong? What's their strong points? What's their weak points? But we don't ask them what they think when it comes to religion, politics, um, climate change, uh, Big Bang, is there a God, none of these things. Do we, ask them about the, our, do we ask our students about their personal beliefs? It's just too dangerous. Another thing that we do is we decide to turn to science fiction. Because science fiction is actually much better at this than we are. Long time ago, at least in this, the, the Star Trek world, we learned that it does no good to poke the audience. Anybody, any Star Trek fan? Anybody? Anybody recognize these clips? Perhaps these some of the most iconic images. Remember this one? This is from Plato's stepchildren. What happened in this image? What was this? What was this act on American TV? Yes, first interracial kiss on TV. And of course, in this episode, they wanted to just kiss. That's what the characters, uh, the actors said they wanted to do. I probably spend too much time at Comic-Con and things like that, but I do know these things. Um, they wanted to just kiss, but they were told they couldn't. So they had to be forced to kiss. They did that, and it was really in your face in the late 1960s. It was so in your face that all the sponsors said that they were going to quit sponsoring the show and it was going to be taken off the air. It just made people angry. Gene Roddenberry learned his lesson well because in later episodes where he really wanted to poke, he didn't poke at people. Instead, he did things like this. This is uh, Let It Be Your Last Battlefield. Does anyone happen to remember what happens in this one? Anybody? What would you say? And they're fighting to the death. And why? Let's see. Black on the right side, white on the left side, white on the right side. So the crew is looking at them going, you guys are nuts. We can't even tell you apart, which is something we frequently say about cultures on this planet. Why are you guys fighting? We can't even tell you apart. But these guys go at it to the bitter end. And of course, the audience responded by saying, wow, they're fighting over nothing. They're destroying their world. That's really stupid. And no sponsors said that they were going to pull their funding from the show. It was clearly about race relations in the 60s, but instead of making people angry, it just engaged people in the conversation. By the time we hit next generation, there was no in-your-face moment. We avoided that entirely. When we wanted to go at something like issues related to homosexuality or sexual orientation, we did it using the engagement, the, the other, the feel sympathy with the characters kind of way. In this, in this particular case, Riker has fallen in love, as he always does, with a woman from an alien planet. And on that alien planet, homosexuality is the norm. And heterosexual relationships are banned. And the two of them get ripped apart, and she gets taken back to her world and, and retrained to be um, homosexual again. 
and you look at that episode, you go, oh my gosh, that's so painful, it's horrible. And then I remember sitting there watching this with people who really had, you know, some issues. And they could hear the words come out of their mouth, and then they went, oh, oh my goodness, did I just say that? Did I just say the government shouldn't have any say-so with regard to your sexual orientation? Oh, no. So science fiction is really much better at this than we are. And um, does anybody here ever, you ever use science fiction in your class? This means, what do, what do you use? What's your piece? Bits of Star Trek occasionally. Bits of Star Trek occasionally? Why wouldn't you? Anybody ever use Frankenstein to teach about ethics? Have your students read Frankenstein? Ever showed uh, bits and pieces of Jurassic Park where it all falls to a heck in a handbasket? Yes. Yes, I'm currently looking at um, issues uh, that I'd like to use some Robert Sawyer to teach. I mean, there's a lot out there. But sometimes science fiction is better at teaching stuff than we are, and we should step back out of the way and let them do it. So anyway, um, what we've learned is that you should not, just because you have a hammer in your hand, you shouldn't treat everything as if it's a nail, that you should find the right tool for the job. If it's simple bad data, tell them that they've got bad data. If it's tougher bad data, like level two, use conceptual change. If it's a P-prim, give them your sympathy and tell them that they have to think around this one. If it's something that requires spatial reasoning, teach it spatially. And if it's a hot button issue with your students, don't go at them. Do not poke the audience <laughs> in those cases. Instead, use some refutational text or use some sci-fi or go at it another way. So I think that's all we had to say. Tim, did, now Tim, did you have anything to say? Well, thank you. So what I was going to say, <laughs> thank you all very much. This was so interesting that I've just taught a unit on photosynthesis in my year 12 biology class. I'm going to go and uh, ask that question and see how many of my students fall into the same trap. Um, <laughs> Ask the science teachers. Thanks, Anna. It'll make me unpopular. Um, this, uh, this talk has been uh, incredibly interesting. Um, what I really liked was that um, Stephanie really uh, put some issues out there, but she had some solutions for us. And so I think we've, uh, we've all learned something from this. Um, so uh, I wanted to open the, uh, the floor to questions. Uh, would anyone like to ask Tim or Stephanie any questions here? Uh, right up the back. Thank you. So this is a really tough piece here, right? Because students will twist whatever you give them into that closer being more. So that, as it turns out in the curriculum, is the only teacher talk that goes on consistently. You have to have the conversation about how, well, we're leaning in a bit here, but if this were, if this were real, you know, let's, we would be at one end of the continent and, and the sun would be at the other. Does our little tilt like this matter? And they, they go, no, well, you know, it's tilted more in my face now. I can see it. And I can't entirely explain why it works, but it works consistently. Uh, and from kindergarten, where honestly, we've just looked at day-night issues all the way up into college with pre-service teachers. But I wouldn't say it's the only thing we've ever seen work. Um, I, I'm overstepping my bounds with that. There have, been a, there have been studies done on very sophisticated computer modeling games where well, we've seen the same kind of effects. But it's again, it's a spatial instruction. I just tend to not go with those kinds of things because I frequently taught in places where there's no funding and there wasn't a computer for every kid. And so I like teaching interventions that cost very little money and are easy for anybody to use. But it I know, it's the strangest thing, isn't it? But it works. So 
The question was, uh, we use the word misconception, but people also talk about alternative conceptions. Occasionally talk about alternative frameworks, naive models, naive conceptions. Um, the, the list is very, very long. And people that take this stuff very seriously have very subtle definition, differences from the different definitions. Um, and I used to really think that was really cool, but I just got lost in it. I got lost in the definitions of what kind of is this what's that about, because they weren't really descriptive. The difference between an alternative conception, misconception, scientific inaccuracy, uh, naive belief was really about who's the blame. You know, we don't want to say misconceptions because we don't want to say students are wrong because that doesn't feel right. So how else can we do that? And that just didn't get us anywhere until we start saying there are these things which we call misconceptions for lack of a better word and there are different styles of them and each of these different styles require a different uh, different attack. Then we started to make some progress again. So in the U.S., we don't hear a lot of people arguing about those those terms a lot, but it still does show up. And it gets when we try to publish papers and publish books on this, it gets us into trouble if we get the wrong reviewer all the time. So it is it's still a real issue. I personally think that's more of an issue of uh, people wanting to hear themselves talk rather than trying to fix the problem. In either case, it's students are struggling to learn things. So call it an alternative conception or misconception if you want. Let's find an answer to it. Good question. Thank you very much. Um, can we just uh, uh, finish the question there in the interest of the interest uh, on. Um, on behalf of everybody, uh, Tim, I'd like to thank you uh, for that really, very inspiring uh, talk. And I'd like to keep on doing this. I'm not sure if you can do this.